Um, welcome to the second edition of um, TCRM Talks. Um, our speaker today is um, Mr. Kenneth Asamita, and the topic will be the 30-year growth and development plan for Cross River State. Um, today is the 5th of June, 2022. Um, a brief about the um, TCRM. Um, the Cross River Movement is a non-partisan, non-governmental, not-for-profit, mm -hmm. and lovers of Cross River State uh, worldwide um, to provide a platform for them to engage, collaborate, and take action towards creating a brighter future for Cross River State. Um, about TCRM Talks, um, this is a platform for us to exchange ideas and that can contribute to the development of Cross River State, again, um, following the, the motto of the, of the TCRM organization. Um, a background to today's talk, um, without stealing the thunder of the speaker. Um, as we prepare for a new administration in Cross River State, um, we realize the importance of persuading elected officials to em embrace a strategic plan for growth and development of the state. Um, again, I think we're just trying to move away from Amala politics to something that's a bit more concrete and coherent. Um, a strategic plan will provide governments at all levels a focused roadmap for working collab collectively along with other stakeholders for the growth and development of the state. Um, to borrow the words of uh, Bill Clinton uh, back in his campaign days, he used to say, it's the economy, stupid. Um, so I think, um, again, that's what we hear about, is the economy of the state. Um, on, on our speaker today, uh, Mr. Ken Asamita, um, he is the Executive Secretary of mm -hmm. the Calabar Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture an organization that represents the organized private sector in Cross River State. So without much ado, I will hand over to Mr. Ken uh, to take us through his talk for today. Can everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to share. And um, like you have said, um, a growth and development strategy is very key to helping governments you know, direct their uh, activities and, and their paths. And um, if we may get into the business of the day very quickly, I would ask that, um, uh, Edith Young or Isto, could you please share the document? Could you please share the presentation? I, I've shared them. Let's, let's start looking through the slides. Or I can be granted permission to share mine. Yeah, okay. yes, so I, I can think, go ahead and share yours. Yeah, go ahead um, and share. I think you've been made a co-host now, so you can do that yourself. It, it's, still, it's still telling me only the host can share this meeting. You're, you're a co-host now. Okay, I'm a co-host now, so let's see that. Okay, I've, I've seen that. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to share shortly um, slides that we're going to discuss today on the growth and development strategy of Cross River State. Um, it's a very simple, it's, it's, it's actually a 330 page document that was done in um, mm. 2018. And um, part of the team that was involved in developing that uh, document 
was the uh, Kwasiva State um, Calabar Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture. We took active part in the development of this, uh, of this strategy for the government. It is basically a, a 30 year growth and development um, strategy covering the period from 2018 to 2048. So basically what has been done is that um, Mosiva State has tried to develop a, a long-term plan for itself to guide and direct its, um, its growth and development, especially growing the economy, growing prosperity for its citizens, and also developing the key sectors of the state's economy. And that uh, basically drives, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm finding it hard to, for it to open up. I don't know why I'm having this challenge. I don't know why I'm having this challenge. Um, it's giving me a little bit of um, challenge now. But, but basically, basically, um, while I'm still trying to share it, I'm, I'm going to be talking us through this. Basically, the growth and development I've, strategy, like I, I said, we've got um, that on. although okay. hello? we've got it on. Hello, we've got the slides on the screen. You have it on. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. OK. All right. Then. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, okay. So, um, like I said, you know, developing a growth and development strategy is not um, a key requirement of government, but it helps in, in directing government's path. Uh, so, if you will, go to the next slide, please. So basically, what, what we're going to do um, is we're going to take, go through this um, presentation by just looking at, um, we first look at the background, we look at the situational analysis of cross river state, we look at the rationale why, you know, the GDS is necessary, what it actually, I think somebody, somebody's not muted. So we look at the rationale for the GDS. We look at what is contained inside the GDS and basically how it affects us. So next slide, please. Okay, now, um, Going through the GDS, we see certain endorsements that have taken place. The first endorsement we see here is an endorsement by the government of the state, which goes through that um, there's meant to be a political will and commitment to implementing this growth and development strategy once it has been completely developed. Um, according to the words of the governor, he says that the cross river state growth and development strategy provides a holistic response to the issues and opportunities for the inclusive and sustainable prosperity of our people over the short, medium, and long term. I am confident that all Kosovarians, friends of the state, development partners, investors, and other interests would find this effort useful and would support its adoption to foster the sustainable growth and development of Kosovo State. This was a commitment as made by the governor. Next slide, please. To show that um, the growth and development strategy was a multi-sector and um, wide-based uh, 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 document, the Partnership Initiative for the Niger Delta, PIN, also supported and committed 
uh, you know, to helping Kosovo State develop and implement the strategy. So this statement was made by the executive director of PIN, um, and he basically said that the Foundation for Partnership Initiatives endorses the Kosovo State 30 year growth and development strategy as a credible working document, which will help to promote sustainable development and generate economic opportunities for accelerating growth and development for the people of Kosovo State. So next slide. Program, I know, and it was the um, QSO International. QSO International is a Canadian uh, international development agency, and this was a statement by the country representative, Mr. Brima Sonko, where he noted that the finalization of the document is indeed timely. and encourages all development partners to support strategy. Kusu and partners are proud to be associated that the state consider development decisions. It's our next slide. So we now go to um, going basically looking at where Kosovo State is today. Next slide. Um, so I'm just gonna talk, take us through very quickly and very briefly about Kosovo State. Um, presently, Kosovo State's economy does not reflect its strategic location. You know, the state is blessed with arable land suitable for a wide variety of crops, you know, vast deposits of diverse solid minerals, a scenic mountains and forests, and a reputation for being a safe place to live and work. Key demographic, basically, the state um, covers a, a, a land size of 23,000 square kilometers which is approximately 6.3% of Nigeria's land mass. It accounts for over 60% of Nigeria's forest reserves. And this, this has a total carbon value in excess of $1.5 billion. Um, the population of the state is about 4.6 million. That's um, taking a 2.8% growth from the 2006 census. So that's where we are. Um, as at 2020, the GDP of the state was estimated about 9.3 trillion. So next slide. So still on Crossover State, we now look at the basis, you know, for why, why the GDS was done. We looked at the key econometrics as at 2018. And you find out that as at 2018, Crossover State's revenue base was made up of basically two sources of revenue the Federal Allocation uh, uh, Commission, FAC revenue, and then internally generated revenue. FAC accounted for about 76.34%, while IGR only accounted for 23.6% of, um, of revenues for, for the state. Um, the state also happens to be the sixth most indebted state in Nigeria as at 2018, with a total debt profile of about 236 billion made up of um, 166 billion naira as domestic debt and 193.76 million dollars as um, uh, foreign debt and what we found out was that within the past five years you know the the, the growth rate of the debt was about 50.37 percent and, and and it keeps climbing and the unemployment and combined unemployment and underemployment rate in the states was about 71.46. Uh, if you break this down, unemployment was about 37%, and then the rest was underemployment. Um, the estimated poverty rate in the state is about 36.29%. Um, 36 so, you know, looking at these key econometrics, these realities presented the compelling case for the states to intervene and to arrest the strength, which was why the growth and development um, strategy was actually then uh, conceptualized and developed. So most of this data that we've just shared um, have been taken from the National Bureau of Statistics, the Debt Management Office, Central Bank of Nigeria, and the SFTAS, uh, SFTS performance. The SFTS is actually a World Bank assisted program that helps in um, transparent fiscal transparency for states and accountability in states. So, um, so next slide, please. 
So when, when we looked at that, um, looked at the econometrics, we now asked what basically are the comparative advantages that Kosovo State has? And we see that its strategic location is number one. It has a three-pronged access point for international trade for the whole of East and Northeast of Nigeria. You know, this gives Kosovo State a huge locational advantage. It has access to Cameroon via the Trans-African Highway, access to Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Angola, and other Central African countries via you know, our local uh, sea route. The state has vast deposits of solid minerals. You know, it's endowed with a um, range of metallic and non-metallic uh, solid minerals, gems, precious stones. You know, you can count from limestone, gypsum, barite salt, granite, bentonite, clay, even tourmaline, emeralds, amethyst have been found in the state in, in, in uh, considerable commercial quantities in Kosovo state. Safety was another key comparative advantage. Despite the challenges that the state is facing, um, Kosovo state is still one of Nigeria's safest and most peaceful states. There is a significant um, and historical military and police presence, which the state can leverage on to improve on its security, architecture, and network. Uh, next slide, please. The state, the state also is well endowed in terms of its tourism assets. Um, there are quite a number of um, tourist sites in the state, from the mountain resort, canopy walk, we have Bokum Waterfalls, Old Residency Museum, just to mention a few. And the state also has a seaport and a free trade zone. This is a well-developed port, um, which is an attractive alternative to both the Lagos and Port Harcourt ports, especially when you consider the uh, congestion that is being faced in other states of, of uh, in these other two states. Um, it has two contiguous uh, free trade zones, of course, the Calabar free trade zone, and of course, the Tinapa free trade zone. You saw, next slide. So having looked at that compelling reason and the advantages that Kosovo State had, we asked ourselves, why did we have to go through the GDS? Why did we have to chart a, development, a new development trajectory for Kosovo State? Next slide. Um, like I said, although the preparation of a GDS is not a legislative requirement, it, however, plays a very key role in ensuring, you know, an effective and coordinated delivery of um, the overall development plans and programs in any state. It will allow us as a state to become focused and decisive. It will enable us to weigh, tr weigh trade-offs and make, you know, um, right choices in the face of you know competing demands for both resources and, um, and, 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 and activities. It allows us to develop and implement um, consistent strategies and programs. And it also ensures that plans reflect the shared visions of all the stakeholders and the role players. Now, what Kosovo State did was to ensure that uh, in developing this roadmap for the achievement of its um, inclusive and sustainable development, it consulted widely. Um, we had stakeholders from different perspectives. The private sector was very much uh, represented you know, at, at, at the level of the organized private sector network. And I believe that throughout that period, um, I recall that Mr. Saw Basi was the leader of the private sector team that participated in developing this, this document. So um, he's not too far away from here. Next slide, please. So, so the GDS actually takes a sector-based approach, you know, and it revolves on the full chrome of the state's vision. And what is the state's vision? Basically, Kosovo State wants to be a prosperous Nigerian state with healthy and well-educated citizens living in harmony with people and nature pursuing inclusive and sustainable growth moderated by good governance. So when you looked at all of this, the state assumed that um, it, it was going to capitalize on some of the distinctive assets which it had. And what were those distinctive assets that we recognized? The, its youthful population, the state has quite a youthful population. Its coastal location with the diverse blue economy options, I've talked about the issue of its strategic location being very key. Um, there were huge green, green economy opportunities, you know, in the states, you know, given the diverse agroecological uniqueness of Kosovo State. Like I said, 
almost 30% of the state is, is, is under forest cover. And this accounts for about 60% of Nigeria's um, last uh, remaining vestiges of virgin forest. And um, of course, creating a favorable investment climate for private sector participation amongst other intangibles. Next slide, please. So in, in guiding the development of the GDS, of growth and development strategy, the state looked at a continuous commitment to governance and institutional reforms. It looked at a continuous and deliberate diversification of the state's economy in the most innovative manner. You know, um, it, looked about, it looked at the full or partial divestment of public sector holdings in the state's legacy assets. Um, the, the aim of, part of the aim of this um, GDS is to ensure that some of the state's legacy assets, the Tinapa resort, most of the industrial um, facilities that are being built by the present administration rises to include or to allow for private sector driven uh, which means the state has to use guidance to ensure that all of these assets are placed in the hands of the private sector. So there's also a continuous investment in its people and the provision of social and economic infrastructure. And lastly, there was a commitment um, to the state's green economy, green jobs framework. In fact, it might interest all of you to know that Kosovo State was the first state in Nigeria to develop a green economy framework for its, um, for its, its growth and development. And, and this was assisted again by QSO International. <sighs> Okay, next slide. So we're gonna be now looking at the, next slide, the, 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 the GDS in, in detail. Now, what is the outline of the GDS? What's the structure? You see that the GDS has been developed in looking from right to left of your screen. The GDS has been developed in four thematic sectors, 21 subsectors with 503 strategic actions and activities to be undertaken to ensure that the goals of the growth and development strategy is achieved. Next slide. Now, we talked about the development pillars. Those are the four, uh, the four thematic key thematic areas. And these four thematic areas included um, governance and institutions, social development, sustainable economic growth, and then energy, of course, green energy and infrastructure. Now, each of the thematic areas we are, we are referring to here are sectors, and they comprise a number of subsectors. The subsectors are the 21 subsectors that are identified earlier on. And all government MDAs, public sector of Kosovo state, are split into all of these uh, subsectors under the respective pillars. Um, like if you see the diagram there, it shows you underlying everything is, is gender and social inclusion across board. Now, the, the next stages are looking at the governance and institutional pillar. The aim of that pillar is to provide an efficient, effective and responsive public service, utilizing global best practices in service delivery. So that is one pillar. The pillar of social development basically is looking at providing an efficient and effective and responsible social development services, which is comparable to global standards. And of course, the sustainable development pillar look, aims at utilizing the sustainable strategies in developing the state's endowments for the well-being and development of its people. And lastly, the energy and infrastructure pillar uh, is looking to facilitate access for all citizens to energy and infrastructure of the right quality and in sufficient quantities. And we believe that building on these four pillars, the state then would be able to achieve its ultimate goal of being the prosperous Nigerian state with healthy, well-educated citizens living in harmony with people and nature. And pursuing its now, the, the, the GDS 
were dependent on a number of factors and a number of key uh, issues. And these issues included one, an inclusive private sector and community development would not have addressed respective growth development transparency and accountability so it's it's most of what is going done under the gds is meant to be private sector and community driven um of course the gds would undergo a five yearly review to accommodate new interventions and adjustments within the context of uh, dynamic socioeconomic environment now if you look at this uh, number b dependent we'll realize that the year 2023 next year is actually the year where the first review of this GDS is meant to um, actually take place. And the state is also expected to develop a five yearly fiscal plan, you know, as laid out in the medium term expenditure framework for the state, which will outline the expenditure and revenue uh, framework for states, including ways of funding the GDS, you know, for, for the period. And of course, there has to be continuous updates of the respective sectors you know, from the monitoring framework that is developed under the GDS. Next slide. Now we go into the main, the midst of, of the GDS, GDS itself. Like I said, it's, it's, it's based on four thematic pillars, governance institutions, um, social development, sustainable development, energy and infrastructure. So looking at the governance and institutions uh, pillar, the goal you know, for this pillar was to have an efficient and effective and responsive public service, which utilizes glo global best practices in its service delivery. You know, the governance institutions in the States were meant to be reconfigured they are meant to be improved continuously to make them more effective and efficient for service delivery. The human resource structure of, 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 its, of the governance and institutions will be reviewed at regular intervals and renewed as appropriate. The skill gaps you know, um, would be analyzed regularly and carried out at appropriate intervals. And the outcomes of this um, skill gap analysis will form the basis of the training, retraining, and reorientation of the civil and public servants. Now, in terms of the strategies for achieving all of these goals, um, the strategies were revolving around key reforms and improvements in certain targeted uh, governance sectors and institutions. Under the governance institutions, the state um, seven strategic um, subsectors. Are, uh, are placed under the governance institutions. This included the state civil service, where about 12 um, key strategic reforms and improvements have been you know, laid out in the growth and development strategy. In the local government administration, about 10 key strategic reforms and improvements have been developed. In the law and justice sector, about 13 uh, key strategic reforms in judicial service, 10 of those key strategic reforms in legislative and political sector, about 13 key strategic uh, reforms and improvements have been laid out. And under the traditional institutions and chief tenancy affairs, about five. And in terms of public procurement and price intelligence, 15 key strategic reforms improvements have been targeted. That, 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 in a nutshell, is how and, uh, the go governance and institutions pillar is, is going to be uh, developed over the planned period. Next slide. Under the social development pillar, um, the thrust was to provide an eff effective, efficient, and responsible social development service, which is meant to ensure equitable access to the needed social services by every citizen of the state. Um, the objectives of, of the social development policy and thrust was to one, institutionalize social protection as a vehicle to improve social justice and reduce socioeconomic disparities amongst citizens in the state. Um, two, it's aimed to reduce extreme poverty amongst the most deprived. Three, reduce teenage childbearing from the current level of 18.4%, provide social welfare and improve food security and nutrition, 
and ensure that citizens have access to and utilize basic social services and infrastructure. Now, what are the subsectors under the social development? We have three of them. We have the health sec healthcare sector, we have the educational sector and uh, educational administration sector, and then of course we have the youth and sports development sector. Now, the strategies, the key strategies and activities under this uh, social development pillar was um, aimed at um, key strategic reforms, activities, provision and improvement in infrastructure, quality manpower, and service programs and delivery within these um, three key subsectors. And 23 specific uh, strategies were developed under the healthcare sector, five in the educational sector, and 15 in the youth and sports um, development sector. So in a nutshell, that is the, the, the structure of, of the social development uh, sector. Next slide, please. The next sector that we're going to look at is the sustainable development sector. Now, this the sector that basically speaks to the economy, economic growth and development, prosperity, well-being of the people in terms of wealth and, and, and prosperity. So the goal for the sustainable development uh, pillar was to utilize sustainable strategies in developing the state's endowments for the well-being and development of um, its people. Now, the state, of course, as we know, has huge natural endowments, you know, um, and basically the government is intended to develop this natural endowment, um, which of course supports a robust tourism, agriculture, and solid minerals development. These endowments, are meant to be utilized with particular attention paid to social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Um, the state also intends to promote private sector-driven economic development by providing the required enabling. In enabling here, we look at the legal, we look at the regulatory, and we look at the fiscal environment for private investment and investors to drive the state. Now, the specific strategies uh, to achieve all of this, again, was developed around um, its strategic activities, um, programs and infrastructure provision, improvements, you know, in terms of quality manpower and resources in the following area. Now, the subsectors that are outlined under the sustainable development pillar included the environment, forestry management and conservation, of which there are about 40 strategic activities, programs, and uh, you know, improvements to be done there. We look also at the agricultural development and linkage uh, subsector, where 43 specific and strategic activities, programs, and interventions have been outlined. Then under the sustainable industrialization, 11 of such strategic interventions have been outlined. And of course, 24 outlined in the culture and tourism subsector of the sustainable development pillar for the state's um, growth and development strategy. Now, what, 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 what this shows us basically is that, and, and, and you know, in terms of all of these pillars, these subsectors, these um, strategic outcomes and activities, they are also, uh, you know, clearly articulated specific outcomes that are expected to be achieved once these strategic interventions have been carried uh, out under the different pillars. Next slide, please. So under the energy and infrastructure pillar, uh, to facilitate access to infrastructure quality and efficient quantities for all citizens of the state. Now, the key policy thrust of, of government here is to ensure that act, there's access for every citizen to energy and infrastructure of the right uh, quality and sufficient quantity. There's also achieving self-sufficiency in sustainable infrastructure for social economic development of the state. So on that basis, this particular uh, pillar was broken down into seven, again, seven subsectors. 
the power supply sector, the oil and gas sector, the non-mineral oil development, non-mineral, non-oil mineral development sector, the ICT sector, the transformative, transformative infrastructure sector, affordable housing, sustainable urban and rural water sector. Now, the strategic activities, you know, and interventions within this area, again, were aimed to achieve um, activities, programs, and provision of infrastructure, improvement of existing infrastructure also, and of course, development of quality manpower. And we have identified 49 in the power supply sector, 27 of such interventions in the oil and gas opportunities, especially the oil and gas opportunities, all the 27 uh, activities and strategic interventions are basically new because Cross River State has not been known in terms of um, oil and gas uh, activities. I think the only old um, uh, activity under that oil and gas is the development of the Calabar Energy City project, which was, of course, started during the early Moke administration. Then um, we're looking at eight of such interventions in the non-oil minerals uh, development sector, 13 interventions in ICT, 45 in the transformative infrastructure sector. Now, in terms of the transformative infrastructure sector, it will interest us to know that this sector was actually specially you know, put aside and it included interventions in the, um, the deep sea port and the superhighway projects, Calas Vegas, urban and rural roads interventions, urban transportation, and then the rural access and mobility uh, project sectors. These are the key, these are the specific areas that fall under the transformative infrastructure because we believe that the investment within the sectors were meant to be impact investments that will deliver specific uh, targeted outcomes for both the state and its citizens. Then in the affordable housing sector, there were 24 of such um, strategic interventions planned out and then 12 in the sustainable urban and rural water uh, supply sector. So this, this is a breakdown of the four uh, uh, key thematic pillars and 19 of the subsectors that are available. Now we are going to look at three other sectors that cut across almost all the subsectors that we have here. So we we'll go to the next slide, please. So when we come to the next slide, we look at what we call the cross-cutting issues and opportunities. Now, two of these um, cross-cutting issues and opportunities were identified. And um, these are sectors, these are opportunities and issues that impact across the key thematic sectors and the subsectors, like I have earlier said, and they included gender development and, of course, public information management. Under the gender development, the state basically is saying that it's committed to bridging the current gender gaps through advocacy, networking, and support programs. It is also committed to sustaining and improving its public information uh, management through its respective media outfits and the brand architecture which the state is going to throw out. Now, for strategic um, activities and interventions within the sector, we identified seven of them in the gender development sector and 41 of them in the public information management um, sector. Next slide, please. The next cross-cutting sector was the um, legacy assets and debt solutions. Um, you know, when we're looking at the key econometrics of the state, we noted that Cross River State was the sixth most indebted state with over 236 billion in terms of its debt, uh, debt uh, profile or debt uh, structure. Now, the reason why this was taken as a specific different sector was that Cross River State actually is one of the few states, you know, that are still having a substantial stock of under, underperforming legacy assets. Of course, within us now, we know that, let's look at all the infra, uh, industries that have been built. Let's look at Tinapa, let's look at the Calabar port. Let's look at everything that is available in Cross River State. You see that most of this infrastructure, most of these assets are practically actually underperforming. They are not performing to their uh, ultimate um, 
potentials. So it was necessary that we took them apart separately and looked at what was going to how, how things were going to be done in terms of um, reforming and reviewing them. Now, um, we also noted that the state's huge debt portfolio is not also unconnected with some of this, uh, some of the investments in this uh, legacy asset. Of course, we know how much the state had to borrow in terms of putting together the Tinapa uh, Business Resort Facility, the Calabar uh, International Convention Center, and other of its, especially and um, lately, some of the industries that it has um, attempted to build. It has borrowed heavily to get into most of this. And right now, like we said, they are underperforming. And so we need to look at ways of which we can turn them around and make them uh, performing assets once more. So the size of, of, of this legacy assets on the state socioeconomic balance sheet explains you know, the justification for the long-term strategy which the state has taken to begin the process of a Colgate strategic intervention to the issues and providing a platform to successfully to succeeding administrations throughout the plan period. Now, the inter intention here is to ensure that whatever the current administration starts in terms of addressing uh, a re reorganization or restructuring of these leg leg legacy assets would be continued by succeeding um, administrations. So the strategies that were laid out for achieving the targets under this, you know, revolved around restructuring the legacy assets first and foremost, restructure them uh, in terms of ownership, in terms of um, the operationality of, of it all, and then embark on a sustainable management of the debt of the state. Now, its strategic interventions were identified in the area of legacy assets uh, uh, restructuring and about five strategic interventions and uh, systems identified in the management sustained debt stock. Next. So having looked at um, all of the areas, all of the, the, the four thematic areas, the, 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 the 20 um, subsectors, and about the almost 490 um, specific strategic activities that have been planned out under the GDS. What comes to mind is basically how are we going to fund all of this? How are we going to implement them? Because, you, of course, you know that the funding of all of these interventions, activities, uh, is very critical to its success, in very, especially in a very timely manner. So a funding strategy which determines the financial requirements for the state over the planned period and its details you know, for the period were actually developed. And what happened was that it outlined how the state was going to raise money and resources in order to carry out the objectives as stated in the growth and development strategy. It will also enable the states to draw up a clear plan for delivering the service in future and a shared on the understanding of how this, you know, of course, will be achieved. Um, it also demonstrates to potential funders, especially development partners, uh, that the state has carefully thought through the process of securing its ongoing funding for the work it hopes to deliver in the long term, which will also help in attracting support from such development institutions. And of course, it will help prioritize fundraising efforts and avoid wasting time and resources. Now, under the public finance management um, subsector, the state identified um, a number of strategic activities programs and, uh, that it was going to embark on. Six of them were specifically outlined in, in improving fiscal accountability and transparency. For us, we felt that improving our fiscal accountability and transparency is very, very key. Increasing public revenue, its, its strategic interventions were identified and outlined there. Um, seven, of, seven such interventions were also identified in improving public financial management and the rationalization of public expenditure. It was very, very necessary that we considered the issue of rationalization of public expenditure so that we could plug 
um, wasteful expenditures by government and begin to actually look at um, a, a, a sustainable method of, of managing um, uh, the state's uh, public funds. And of course, there were four um, strategic uh, in outlined in the sustainable debt management for the state. So, ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, you know, as, as best as I have been able to um, condense a 330 page document, which I'm sure if you want, um, Isso and team can share that full growth, growth, develop, growth and development strategy with every single one of us if we want, in addition to the slides. Um, that's, that's in a nutshell basically explains the growth and development strategy of the state. Now, we're going to look at how, how, how does it basically affect us? So please, next slide. So all, all of this, four thematic areas, 21 um, subsectors, 503 uh, strategic activities and interventions. What is going to be the impact on, on the average cost of area and on cost of our states as a state in the whole? Um, next slide, please. So how does the GDS affect us? Basically, because this GDS takes its roots from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Program mm -hmm. and the National Development Plan of Nigeria, um, it opens up opportunities for the creation of prosperity from the micro to the macro level for Kosovarians and the state. Two, it also presents the building blocks for the economic growth of the state, as well as the citizens who can leverage the resources and opportunities offered in whatever uh, programs and plans that government is going to carry out during this plan period. Three, the GDS also supports current and future generations in the state with new jobs being created, improved government revenues, improved livelihoods for everyone, and access to quality social amenities. And of course, live, la lastly, there's going to be improved social and economic infrastructure across the state in terms of looking at our schools, our hospitals, our roads. Now, some of the key things that we have identified, you know, going forward is if you look at um if, if you go go through that gds and you look education sector you know and um, you talked about you know developing an inclusive and functional education it began by identifying what certain some, some of the goals that we identified under the education sector included things like student to teacher ratios you know um, student to classroom ratios classroom to laboratory ratios a target of literacy rate for the state, you know, enrollment in school, and all, all of this um, very, very key and, 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 and interesting um, indices were looked at in the course of um, developing this uh, growth and development strategy for the state, basically. So um, I think um, I have tried to do as best of um, as I can in terms of um, sharing this growth and development strategy plans with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. That that was mm -hmm. um, that was quite a lot you've been through. So um, I, I'm looking at the clock, but um, I just want to put this out to anyone out there. Um, has anyone got any questions? I know I, I haven't looked on the chat. I know sometimes people put things on the chat. There's been nothing on the chat. I think everyone has been engrossed as I have been, <laughs> just said, <laughs> trying to keep up to pace with yourself and Ken as you as you went through those slides. So, um, oh, David, David's got a question for you. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Well, uh, even though I, I missed maybe half of your presentation because I had something else I was dealing with. But a quick one. On the issue of vocational yeah. training, since you were talking about yes. education, now that's post-primary education, vocational training specifically. Sure. Does, the, does the DDS in any way yes, um, articulate any strategies for the state in the development of vocational training that skill sets, be they post-primary or post-tertiary? 
what vocational. So it's it's an ability uh, like okay, HND education in um, let's say tourism. Let's use tourism as an example. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. The, in the areas like uh, waitress, you know, wait being a waiter or being a cook or a chef or uh, yes. you know, in, in the tourism yeah. sector, there is service delivery is the business. You know, service delivery is the business. So yes. if you have poor, poor service delivery, then um, you are definitely have a problem. So in terms of the GDS, I haven't read through the GDS, to be honest with you. Um, uh, yeah. I'm hoping to be able to see your, your, this your summary and then maybe extract some, some baseline points there and then move forward from there. But is there any, yeah. is there any addressing the issue of vocational training? Yes, there was very specifically, you know, noted in the GDS that um, two, two key areas were very, very, um, uh, were put on the front burner, the issue of vocational and technical education, and then the issue of um, um, developing a very solid STEM base for crossover state education. That's in terms of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, you know, a system education base was, those were the two key things that, that were uh, um, on Is it me or is Ken Hanji? Lined in the, the interventions with organizations like uh, technical and yes, the work. Hello, can you hear me or am I hanging? We we can hear you. Okay, okay, no, because I think you probably lost. Yeah. Okay, Ken, Ken, Ken is the one that has the problem. It looked like he was so. hanging yes. on my side. Okay, okay, okay. I wasn't sure whether it was me that was hanging. It was him that was hanging. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it looks like we've lost um Ken on there. So um, I'll I'll move on and, and ask if if anyone else has, has got um, another question. Um, I know Ken's not there. I think um, we might try and um, see how we can open, make a discussion in, in view of the fact that Ken's um, dropped off. Okay. Um, I, th I think um, one of the things we're looking at doing, and, and again, I think I'm just going to try and fill in the gap um, while, while we try and wait for Ken uh, to come back. Uh, please let me know if, if it comes back online. Um, is, is to try and use this growth and development um, strategy that has been put together um, to kind of um, become a, a guiding light going forward um, to kind of hold um, the incoming and successive administrations to account such that we have a a coherent and continuous policy in the state, you know. Um, mm. I've heard it in, in other, in other uh, forums, people say things like government is a continuum, but yes, I think to make government a continuum, you actually have to have successive governments building upon the policy of, of previous ones. Um, I think mm. for, my, for me, one of the two things that really um, struck out to me when Ken was presenting this really, and, and as I really was going to ask the question was, um, the state being the sixth most indebted state, an indebted state, crossover state, and having a ratio of approximately 75% from the federal allocation and 25% as um, internally generated revenue, you know, um, what do we do with all these legacy assets and um, and debt solutions that we see, you know, um, how, how, how could we resolve them and, and harness this? Because I see this as a very, as a very big pitfall. Um, so, um, in, in terms of um, the internally generated revenue, 
Hello. Hello, yes, I can hear you now, Ken. I think you're back, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I'm back, yes. I, I said that um, in terms of internally generated um, revenue, um, very, very clear um, strategies were developed, you know, for, for achieving that. Um, one of such included the fact that um, the, the, the strengthening of the internal revenue service was very key to achieving a very strong and um, functional uh, uh, internally generated revenue structure for the state. Um, also, the structure of the state in terms of business climate mm -hmm. interventions by government and you know, a, a clear, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to look for the words to use. It, it, was, it was thought through impacts of internet generated revenue on businesses, the business climate, all of that were linked together to ensure that um, whatever revenues, you know, that are accrued to government, including things like widening the tax net, uh, providing incentives for early payments and all of such uh, key uh, activities where Okay, it looks like we've lost um, Ken again. Um, this Yep, I think we have lost him again. So um, I think I'll, I'll look on to the, on the chat. I think um, John Atsu has posted a question. I think there's two parts um, to his question. Uh, uh, John, do you, want, do you want to go through the first part of mm -hmm. your question? And then, and I think you can bring the second part after because I think the second part actually um, hits on one of the things mm -hmm. we're trying to bring up today um, as part of this talk. Okay, I'll, I'll read I'll read this question out then. I think um, it's probably not yes, still on mute. So the first part of John's question was, how enforceable is the GDS? Um, is there a part to legislate its enforcement for the entire period, which will compel successive administrations after the others to comply? I fear that without such, we may just be having another talk shop. So. Um, I think I agree with um, John um, on that. I think one of the things we're looking um, to do here, and I think what I've said earlier was um, to kind of try to elevate the GDS to be like the guiding light going forward for the state. Mm -hmm. um, and we can then use that to kind of um, compel incoming and successful administrations to kind of follow it. Um, Again, I don't think everything is mm -hmm. left, should be left to government, um, which kind of comes into the second part of your question. You know, So you, you also asked that lastly, should concerned citizens, friends, and private organizations begin to look at ways of enabling some or most of these things outside government, as per government antecedent, and ultimately to avoid disappointment, stagnation, and or uh, retrogression. So uh, one of the things I think we're looking at the TCRM um, is, to, uh, is seeking volunteers and I think partnerships uh, with organizations because I think um, just listening to Ken breeze through that document uh, or the time he spent, uh, I don't think it's something government on its own uh, and especially with um, a state like Cross River State will be able to do on its own. So I think one of the things that TCRM is, is, will be looking at is to um, engender the creation of um, partnerships or volunteers um, who can come in to help drive um, some of the things, um, including the GDS. Um, and, and I think the idea behind the TCRM, again, going forward, will be to try and hold government to account um, in terms of their implementation of um, the growth and development strategy. So, um, 
Oh. We'll see. We'll see. Um, we'll see how that um, goes going forward. But too, can I just um, say something, maybe in response to Jonatsu's, I guess, question or comment? Yeah, yeah go on. Mm. Okay. So, yes, um, you know, it's one thing to put in um, some sort of legislative um, enforcement on the GDS. Yeah? So, you know, you could actually say, okay, House of Assembly, you know, pass this into law and it becomes, uh, it becomes a law basically in cross river state. But, you know, the truth about it is that, you know, we've got laws and the, the problem that I think we face with our laws is the enforcement of those laws. And a governor in Nigeria, not just in Kosovo State, but, you know, across, really almost across the whole country is almost, um, uh, it's almost like an emperor, right? Um, <laughs> the, the judiciary, unfortunately, defers to the executive, the legislature also defers to the executive as well. So in theory, you know, you can give legislative backing to the GDS. In practice, you know, how effective would, would it be in holding the executive accountable for delivering on the GDS? I think that, uh, I'm not saying that we should discard that altogether, but I'm just saying that going down that route, even though it may be worth doing, but, you know, may just be a very theoretical exercise. Maybe a more worthwhile and effective way of um, uh, making sure that the GDS, you know, the government commits to the GDS is by communicating the GDS in such a way that uh, cross variants own it. You know, the people who are affected by it, stakeholders own it and are shouting about it, are speaking about it, are asking questions about it constantly. Um, and, you know, I think that maybe more energy should be devoted to that. And I think that the chances of success would be higher in, in uh, going down that route. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for that um, apt um, summary, um, Iso. Yep, um, and I think I, I can go and, and agree uh, with those views. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, Dave, you got your hand up again, yeah? Yes. No, it just in line with uh, Isol's comment, I actually believe that a blend of what uh, um, um, the, John, the, what's his, John, John Atsu, Atsu, yes, what John Atsu said and um, what Isol said would actually be maybe the way to go. Because I do believe, you know, from the point of view of organized private sector, um, I do believe that if the organized private sector adopted the GDS as a working document that it buys into, and then as organized private sector um, sponsors a bill at the state assembly saying this document, you know, pushing it through to get the legislative endorsement of the GDS, so that it then, be, since it is a private bill, the, the organized private sector would then have the leverage of using it as a reference point, because while they say everybody's, they say holy water is everybody's water, so nobody's water. Now, um, where we sell it to cross variants, now, because it is an everybody's document, it's a nobody's document. But where the organized private sector owns the document, the organized private sector is, just by its definition, is actually an alternate to, or a, a partner. Let me not say alternate. It's, it's, you know, they go hand in hand with the public sector. So the public sector uh, maybe, you know, if, uh, implements things, but the private sector guides them because the private sector are the people that it falls back to. Now, if the GDS works effectively, it is the private sector that will be the first beneficiaries of a well-implemented GDS. The government will benefit 
from the point of view of increased um, taxes from people and you know the the secondary level benefits of uh, of, a, of a booming economy, but the primary level is the organized private sector. You know, so I do believe that such a document, if adopted by the organized private sector and then pushed as a as a as something the organized private sector wants to drive. And then, you know, we can then take it forward from there. Just, just, so really a blend of what John is saying and what he saw is saying, you know, marrying the two together and then driving that process, you know, so the organized private sector then becomes the, the GDS champion, as it were, and drives it. That's just what I just wanted to, you know, swing in there. Thank you. Hello, am I still here? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay then. Um, so so again, th th thanks, Ken. I don't know if you're if you're back online again. Th thanks very much for uh, putting this together. I know uh, in in such a short frame of time mm -hmm. and trying to summarize the whole of that um, GDS into um, a presentation for us today. Um, I think we've, we've, we've had a few chats here. I, I think um, the two pertinent things I can take away from this is how do we get this to become a living document that is living and breathing and owned by the people of the state? You know, so one of the things I'm going to ask people um, on here, any of the viewers and in future, anyone who's um, watching this recording in future, is to ask if you could volunteer or if you have any ideas or if you're aware of any partnerships mm -hmm. or of special vehicles we could create um, to kind of pick up some of the ideas on the GDS and bring them mm -hmm. to fruition. Please get in touch, in touch with us and we will try our utmost best to, to kind of um, help you along the way or put you um, in contact with the right people or actually join with you together um, on that journey of, um, of trying to develop the state. So, and the TCRM will be actively looking for uh, volunteers and partners, so please do contact us. Um, another thing we're going to be doing is to try and get the GDS involved into the political discourse, considering we're going into elections uh, over the next few months and into next year. So what we want to also try and do is, is get the GDS into the political discussion, such that it then becomes a political promise. Yes, it, it may not mean much, but at least it, it gives us something where we can keep reminding them to say, look, this is what he said we're going to do. What are you doing? Why aren't you doing this? And, and also, it also gives us a metric to gauge in terms of the, the people or who are aspiring to be the next um, governor of the state to, to see what they actually know about the state. What policies are they coming what policies are they looking to implement going forward, mm -hmm. you know, such that we move away from, um, what's his name in um, Ibadan, Amala politics, and actually get into a situation where mm -hmm. we're trying to educate people on politics of substance that actually benefit all mm -hmm. of us. So um, thank you very much, um, everyone, for your time. Um, thank you. Um, and our next um, TCRM Talks uh, holds on the 3rd of August. Um, if you would like to feature on any of our talks, uh, do send an email to um, crossrivermovement at gmail.com. And the next TCRM conversation will hold um, next week, Sunday on the 12th of June, which happens to be Democracy Day. So, and we would um, discuss on democracy and the challenges of quality representation in, in Cross River State. So, um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, taking the time this Sunday to spend with us once again, and look forward to seeing you next time on the next TCRM Talks. Mm -hmm.